In this episode of Mind Pump, the world's top fitness, health, and entertainment podcast, we sat down and talked about the habits that we've seen our super healthy clients have. In other words, we sat down and talked about the last 20 years that we've worked as trainers, and we talked about the clients that we knew that did exceptionally well. These are people who had very healthy, effortlessly healthy lifestyles, people who didn't gain the weight back and didn't have this yo-yo relationship with exercise and diet, people who were truly healthy. We narrowed down 10 habits that they all seemed to have in common. Now, this podcast is brought to you by our sponsor, Four Sigmatic. Four Sigmatic has some of the best mushroom-based supplements you'll find anywhere. Now, one of my favorite products from them is cordyceps. I love taking their cordyceps supplement before I'm going to be outside in the heat. It makes me heat uh, more heat tolerant. It also helps me with long exercise bouts, so I seem to have more stamina, but they have many other products. One of my other favorite products is their mushroom coffees. These are wonderful coffees that'll help wean you off of the traditional coffee that you're currently having. They combine caffeine with adaptogenic herbs and mushrooms, which help balance out your body's response to caffeine, the stimulant. In other words, you're going to feel energized, but calm, focused, and not jittery. Uh, if you go to foursigmatic.com, that's F-O-U-R-S-I-G-M-A-T-I-C.com forward slash mind pump. Use the code mind pump at checkout. You'll get 15% off any of their products. Also, in this episode, we talk about exercise and some of the points. And if you need guidance, if you want to follow proven workout programs, go to mapsfitnessproducts.com. On there, you'll see at least a dozen, if not more, workout programs designed specifically for different goals and different people. Find the one that suits you best. Sign up for it. Follow it for a full month. If it doesn't blow your mind, if it doesn't give you all the results you think you should get, you can return it for a full refund. Again, that's at mapsfitnessproducts.com. One of the best lessons I learned uh, as an early trainer, both for myself and for my clients, very simple. It's very, very simple. I remember one of my mentors, my early mentors told me, this is, he told me it was kind of like a hack, right? He didn't use that word, um, but he said this is like a secret. He said, look at people who are very successful in whatever area you think you know, uh, you're, you're looking to get better at. So I don't care, business, working out, nutrition, whatever. Find people who, are, who you admire and then just look at their habits, look at their actions and just copy them for mm-hmm. a little while. See what they're doing. You don't even need to understand it necessarily. Study them without being creepy. Study, <laughs> yeah. exactly. Study them and copy them. And I did this. I did this uh, with my workouts. I would watch people who seemed to, to respond really well and do really well, and I'd copy them, and I'd learn through that process. I did this as a trainer, as an early trainer. Mm-hmm. Um, I had a lot of passion, a lot of energy, a lot of excitement, but I did not have a ton of knowledge. I was brand new. So I looked at the trainers around me that I thought were really, really good trainers, and I watched them and copied them. I did this when I had my studio, uh, watching my physical therapist in there and what they did, and massage therapist, the acupuncturist. And I really think that this is an important skill to really pay attention to the habits of people that you may want to be like and figure out why they do those things and what the benefits are and then copy them. So maybe we could, you know, do this episode and talk about those types of things. I love that. I love this conversation and I love the way you took it because this is something that I definitely think was a major contributor to the success I had early on in my career. I, that, that was something I didn't have a, a, a lot of experience. I didn't have an, a, a, an education in the, the background of kinesiology or sports medicine. And so the, the what I did have was an opportunity to work in a place that was highly competitive. There was, and there was twenty trainers there, and there and it was very easy to see who the best was. Mm-hmm. They, they rank, you could I could see who was training the most clients, how much money they were making, and I immediately attached myself to this guy and just asked a million questions. And I remember years later, and when I got into leadership and I had my own staff. It just it just blew my mind how many people did not do that. Like, why would you not look to your peers or look at somebody in the space that is having a ton of success and model many of the things that they are doing to have success? Doesn't mean you got to be them. Doesn't mean you got to actually copy them, but model after a lot of the habits that they've put in place because 
it's normally not something magical that has made this person so successful. It's that they've put a series of habits together that have created the success in whatever endeavor that they're pursuing. Yeah, and it's it's a, it's a, it's really a, a series of trial and error mm-hmm. that they may have gone through to figure these things out. Um, that you can avoid a lot of that trial and error by observing what they do, what are their habits, why are they so successful in this particular area. Um, and then just emulate them. And again, it's not about not being who you are. It really what it is is about emulating them and then learning along through the process and then developing similar habits. Or what you'll find, at least I should say, is you end up developing similar habits because you start to find consistencies among people who tend to be successful in different areas. Yeah, the most most successful people that I've been around are sponges, and and they definitely have paid attention to a lot of these other people around them who are doing very well. That was something that I, you know, I prided myself on in terms of, especially with personal training. I wanted to know how everybody was organizing things, like what kind of, um, you know, communication was most effective with their clients, like how they could get them to adopt these other healthy habits, uh, especially with nutrition. That was such a hard one uh, for me to nail down in the very beginning. It took a long time and I would sit and listen, and I would listen to the presentations of other trainers and how they'd explain it. Listen to dietitians. I even brought in, uh, you know, a dietitian for myself and my own business to up the value of what I was presenting uh, my clients. And I did that purposely to learn from them and to model, uh, you know, some of what the they were promoting to to my clients. And then I would, you know, take that with me on. I have this knowledge now that I can pass on, and it can comes from me. Right, right. So here's what we did. Right, so. So, you know, um, Adam, Justin, and myself uh, for a long time were trainers who train clients or we train trainers who train clients. And so through this process, we've been exposed to thousands, if you add them all up, right, thousands of people that we've either worked with directly or, you know, by proxy, right, through other trainers. And this is over the course of two decades. And what you end up seeing are patterns over that long period of time. You train one person, two people. 10 people, you may not pick up on patterns, but when you do this for 15, 20 years and you do this with a lot of people, very clear patterns start to emerge. And so what we did in this episode is we listed, you know, 10 habits that we've seen that are consistent among the super healthy people that we've been around, the people who seem to do it effortlessly the people who seem to have the best overall health, the people who seem to do it uh, forever. There's, these are not people that are in and out, but rather it's a part of who they are. Well, and the very first one uh, that we listed is plan breakfast. And I love how you had Doug put it up on the notes by by uh, putting a hyphen, right? So it's break, break fast. Yes. Because some people I know right away might be thinking, well, wait a second, what if I intermittent fast? And what if I don't exactly do breakfast? And the, yeah, the key, there's a lot of arguments for both. Right. And I think the key to this first one is is the planning piece. Yes. Not yeah. so much do you eat at 6 a.m. or 9 a.m. or 2 o'clock in the afternoon, but it's that you have stru- structure for the very first meal that you eat for the day. Mm -hmm. And the people that I've seen that have had the most success around nutrition do this. They map out that first meal uh, and all the other ones, but the first one is so important to kick off the day and set the tone. It totally does set the tone because here's, uh, so let me give you an analogy, right? Let's say you have an important presentation at work, right? This is a presentation that your, your potential promotion hinges upon. So you got to do this big presentation. Do you walk into it and then just, you know, wing it? Do you just shoot from the hip? Or do you plan for it? Do you think about the scenarios and what to talk about and how to present the things you want to present? Now, if you're a smart person, you plan. You don't just walk in and then just shoot from the hip because your chances of success are much higher by planning. So this is what we've observed training clients is that people who don't plan breakfast um, and again, break fast, meaning the first meal of the day. So this could be in the morning, it could be in the afternoon, but essentially the first meal of however many meals you're going to have throughout that day. People who plan it um, are more thoughtful. It sets the tone and they tend to eat better throughout the day. Now, people who don't plan it, it tends to become a, a race against the you know nutrition. It tends to become this 
battle throughout the day. Like, oh my gosh, I'm late. Got to get to work. What can I eat? Or Mm -hmm. I haven't eaten anything. Now I'm starving. Let me just grab this quick thing. And then the rest of the day tends to follow suit. And I can argue that the things that you eat probably is among some of the most important thing that you can plan throughout your whole day because your health does affect uh, everything, everything that you do. So the food that you eat is extremely important and planning it is just prioritizing. And when you plan it, your odds of success are much higher. You, you also got to take into account too that, um, and I know that this has happened to you guys. It's not like we've planned every single meal of our lives since we've been personal trainers, but the days that I forget to, to set this up or I neglect you know, planning for what my first meal is going to look like, what ends up happening, and I'm sure this happens to other people, you get your cup of coffee and that's it, and then you get in the car and you, you rush to work and then you get busy with your day and then hours go by, and there was no planning to that. It wasn't like I was intentionally intermittent fasting or trying to do that. I was just busy. And then as the days go by, all of a sudden, hunger starts to kick in because I haven't eaten for a long period of time. Mm-hmm. And then what follows that are all the crazy cravings. Mm-hmm. And what follows that is typically this this struggle of, you know, oh my God, fighting off this craving of what I really want and what's convenient and fast versus, oh, what I should have and I should go prepare this. And it's like, it's a re- mm-hmm. it's very easy to make that quick decision that isn't ideal for you when you haven't set up and you haven't planned. Plus your options that are surrounding you at the time usually aren't all that ideal. Like so we get in, you get yourself in that situation where now I'm really hungry, I haven't really planned, what can I get, you know, in a pinch right now? It's usually not like the best thing for you at that point. And so I like the conversation that this is really more about, you know, the structure of it as opposed to like let's give you these very specific food items that you need to focus on for breakfast uh, because it's just not realistic. Everybody has such like individual biodiversity and, you know, needs that they, they, that they have. And, and also people, uh, you know, have different reactions towards food. So you want to set it up, whatever's best for you, you specifically uh, to then carry you throughout your day and have that energy to pull from. Right. So here's an example of, of planning for breakfast. So yesterday, you know, I'm having dinner with Jessica, and uh, I open the fridge, and I go, oh, we don't have any eggs, so I'm going to go to the grocery store and get some eggs because I, that way I can have those for breakfast tomorrow. That's as simple as that. It's as right. simple as being a little bit prepared and planning for knowing that you're going to eat in a way that's healthy and balanced for you. And, you know, Adam, you mentioned even planning to fast. There's a very, very big difference in how I feel when I plan to fast versus when I don't eat because I didn't think about it. Right. Yeah. Very different feeling. Yeah. If I'm just not eating because I'm too busy and we got meetings and stuff going on, the mindset that I have is much more like uh, I just need to eat yeah. something real Reactionary. quick. Reactionary. Right. If I think to myself, tomorrow I'm going to fast – now, if I don't eat, I don't have that same reactionary mindset. And it's really all about the planning. It doesn't have to be super planned where you, where you meal prep and all your food is prepared. It can be that. But it can be as simple as tomorrow, I'm going to wake up at this time, which gives me 20 minutes, which gives me enough time to eat this kind of breakfast. And at lunchtime, I'm going to bring this food so I can eat that. Or I'm going to schedule this much time to have a break so I can eat at this place. So you know ahead of time what you're going to do. And the successful people that I've worked with, the super healthy people, none of them fly by the seat of their pants when it comes to nutrition. They just don't. All of them have at least some sort of planning that goes into, it, in especially breakfast, but usually all of their meals. So yep. speaking of planning, it, it brings me to the next one, which, uh, and I remember when we first started this podcast, you guys used to like to razz me and tease me about my my water jug that I used to carry <laughs> around, right? Yeah. So. And, and here's the thing, like before I used, I never used to do that before competing, like until I got to a point where, you know, I needed to track and that was important to getting ready for stage. I just said, Oh, I'll just, you know, make an effort to drink water, but I wasn't really counting or tracking or paying attention to. And one of the things that I noticed when I really started to track one, uh, I realized how much I under consumed water. Mm -hmm. And then two, I found when I was busy trying to drink water all day long, that it kept me from making other poor food choices and also drinking my calories and else mm-hmm. other, elsewhere. So it had this kind of two pronged thing that helped with my success in my uh, journey of health and fitness. And so that's something that I, I once I pieced that kind of together, it became like a mandatory thing that I would just teach clients. Like, and, it, and obviously, depending on their size, it's a, the different amount that I'm telling them to target. Although I think anywhere from a half a gallon to a gallon is a, is a pretty good generic number for most people. 
And I would tell them, hey, you know, we, I want you to measure that out and plan to hit that every day. Mm-hmm. And because they were focused on that, they would make other good decisions throughout their day. Yeah, I remember when you were going through that. was like a big uh, epiphany for you. And I, I took that too, uh, to myself to try and start tracking and, and seeing how much water I was really consuming. And when I was going through that process, I realized like even some normal nagging kind of achy pains that I was experiencing in my joints, like I was much better, uh, you, you know, I, those were eliminated on, on some level, just trying to remain hydrated. There's lots of benefits to being hydrated that I didn't even consider, especially like too, like being more foggy and, uh, you know, not as clear thinking as well. It was, it was pretty crazy. Yeah. You notice big differences in your skin. I, I know this was a, a great uh, selling point for my female clients where they, I'd say, hey, let's aim to drink this much water and then let's pay attention to your skin. And they're like, oh my gosh, I can't believe how different you know my skin looks. This is probably one of the most stark contrasts between uh, healthy people and unhealthy people. Healthy people, they drink, they have a different relationship with water. That's what, they, that is their beverage. It's water. I just drink water. Yeah. Anything else is like a dessert or a treat and is very occasional. Unhealthy people, water tends to not be the the, the main beverage. The main mm. beverages tend to be coffees, teas, uh, Soda. sodas, juices, things with flavor. And because they've developed that relationship with with liquids that have flavor, water to them seems boring. Mm-hmm. It seems I've actually had clients tell me they don't like the taste of water, which always was weird to me because it's water. I don't understand. It's not supposed to have <laughs> it's refreshing. It's not right. supposed to have a yeah. taste, right? But super healthy people have a completely different relationship with water. If you go out with them to a restaurant or you go out with them to go eat anywhere else, you notice that when the waiter or waitress comes and says, Hey, would you like anything to drink? 99% of the time, they'd say, oh, just water. I just want water. Almost never would they say, I'll have something else that has flavor in it. And this, again, this is a huge stark contrast. Do you know, so- that's how I, I, so this is something I showed Katrina not that long ago, because we, we were having the, a water discussion, like, because we, uh, we, this is how we, when we eat out, we most always drink water or tea. And, uh, you know, she always, I feel like they, the waiter looks at us like we're being cheap. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, like it's because we're trying to save money and not do that. I'm like, hey, whatever. You know what I'm saying? Who cares? Give but me a I, Voss. But then I and told then her, like, look know. around in the restaurant and I'm like, you can tell people that are health conscious, you pay attention to yes. what's on the table. And a lot of times you'll see, you'll notice the people that look healthier and fit are drinking water at the table versus drinking the soda, the beer, the wine, or all the other great drinks that you can get when you eat out. And it, I always look at it like, it's like a double win. It's like, ah, oh, save it. Because Jesus, when you eat drink, when you have drinks at a restaurant, it's like three to five dollars for a for a drink. And if you get a multiple drinks in a, in a sitting, you know, you're spending an extra 20 bucks just in drinking, drinking your calories. Yeah. So it's a it's like another two prong win for me. It's like, okay, not only am I managing my calories better, I'm also in in in, in taking my my water intake, and then I'm also saving a couple bucks in my in my wallet too. That's yeah. awesome. Um, the next one, this one's an interesting one because I first noticed this when I had this one client I got close to. He was a successful business person. He was always active, but he ended up hiring me because he wanted uh, structured uh, workout programming, and he been he was very successful with his workouts as well. Easy to train, kind of like Doug. You know, Doug was a great client too. He just he did it, applied, and learned, and it's just great working with people like that. But anyhow. He had invited me to his company to speak to his employees about health uh, and fitness because he thought it would be a good thing for me to go talk to some of his staff. So I actually went to his work and spent the whole day with him. And one thing really struck me, very interesting about this guy, whenever he would meet, and I stuck with him all day long. It was pretty cool. I shadowed him all day long. What was really cool is that he would, whenever he'd have a meeting with someone, Someone would meet up with them and be like, oh, you know, we're supposed to have our meeting right now. I'll be like, all right, cool. Let's go outside. And then they'd walk and have their meeting. So every time he met with, he did, he did this like five times that day. Yeah. Every time he'd meet with one of his employees and they'd give him a rundown on statistics or costs or margins or whatever, they would go for a walk outside. And I asked him about this. I said, why do you, why do you, I noticed you walk. Is this because you're so fit, you know, fitness conscious? Is it because you like to maintain your fitness? He goes, actually, that's the side effect. He goes, it's cool that I walk. Throughout the day, he goes, when I when I track my steps, I'm like 20,000 because whenever I'm talking to somebody, I go for a walk. He goes, but that wasn't the primary reason why I did that. He goes, I did that because I noticed it made me sharper. When mm-hmm. I didn't do that, I wasn't as sharp. I, I, I didn't feel like I could 
really empathize as well. My staff, I noticed when we would walk, they were able to convey what they were conveying. Brainstorming was much better. By the way, this is a, a habit that you see artists do quite a bit. Mm -hmm. When artists get stuck, um, when they're writing a book or they're making music and they get stuck on a particular thing, one of the things that they'll do to get through that writer's block or that block is to go for a walk. So one thing that I noticed, I noticed this definitely with him, and then I paid attention to it to the rest of my clients that were really successful. The really successful clients that I trained took walk breaks. They weren't workout breaks. They were walk breaks. Yeah. So like after lunch, after breakfast, you know, when they're having a meeting, when they're talking to somebody, when they're on the phone, they would just go do these short 10, 15 minute walk breaks, breaks throughout the day. Well, we've, we've shared the, the research that supports that when you pair a, a current habit with a new habit, the success rate is like dramatically higher. Right. Mm -hmm. So w pairing walking with something else that you have to do every single day. And this example you're giving right now, the guy who's you know got meetings he does probably every single day with you know three to five people every mm -hmm. so very easy to say hey every time I'm gonna do, uh, you know meet with this person I'm also gonna walk into it I do that here right so we have a staff here and uh, I meet with them on a weekly basis and when I'm kind of getting you know the upload on what, what whatever they're working on project wise instead of us sitting in an office or sitting down in the studio and talking, I normally will have them get up and go walk with me and you know mm. download me on all the information while we're walking around the block. So it's very easy for me to create that habit. The other one that I always love to do is with eating, right? We all mm -hmm. have a meal, you know, multiple meals that we eat a day. And if I can just make a habit out of, hey, getting up after I'm done eating, I'm going to, I'm going to walk, I improve digestion, I'm going to increase my steps, burn more calories. And it's easy for me to be consistent with that. And what people don't realize is those little 10 minute walks paired with meetings, paired with eating, adds up to be a lot of extra steps and movement and calorie burn in a day and yeah. in the week and in months. And that's a massive difference and could be the difference between somebody losing 15 to 20 pounds more fat a year. So it's, and it's a really easy thing to stay consistent with asking someone to go to the gym every day and, you know, train intensely for an hour is a major commitment for a lot of people, but asking most people that, hey, when you do these certain things in the day, can you just do this walking or add that? That's a lot easier. Yeah. I mean, I've pretty much eliminated all treadmill. I used to jump on the treadmill to try and get my cardio, just like everybody else, uh, you know, just to get that additional movement if I'm trying to keep my weight at a certain amount or whatever. So, uh, you know, just like you guys have said, in terms of like using it for those, you know, meetings or for, you know, digestion, huge, but also me commuting, I have like a 45 minute commuting. Uh, uh, back home. And so I, the first thing I do when I get home, which is it, it kind of kills like three birds with one stone. Um, I, I get home, the kids come out with me, the dogs uh, come out with me. Everybody sort of like downloads me about their day, like how, how this online school thing has been going, like, you know, what your struggles have been. Like, it, it's just a much better conversation than it is when I come in and everybody's sort of in their own corner and, uh, you know, off on their own. So it's, it's a great way to then connect with people as well. Yeah. yeah. And, and you know, I mean, let me put it to you this way. Let's say you did, you know, three, 10 minutes. And, and here's the wonderful thing about walking breaks is it doesn't feel like a scheduled workout. It's a lot easier to maintain. But let me, I mean, think about it this way. If you did three 10 minute walks a day, okay, first of all, easy to digest. It's a 10 minute walk. 10 minutes is easy to spare uh, at any given moment throughout the day. You do it after, you know, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. There's three of them. That's 30 minutes of walking cardio every single day. How much easier is it to do that than to schedule a 30 minute cardio session. Yeah. It's a lot easier. Not only that, but the frequent short walk breaks have been shown to improve mood better than a dedicated concentrated uh, bout of cardio. They seem to burn more body fat. They seem to improve productivity better than the concentrated bouts of cardio. So in my personal uh, opinion, and especially through observing clients, walk <clears throat> breaks in terms of uh, being able to stick to it long term, in terms of long term success with your health, far better than the structured, you know, uh, you know, intense bouts of cardio. Now the next one is one that I think, uh, first of all, was not on my list just you know maybe five to ten years ago, oh, yeah. and you know although we didn't order these in priority, I think this one is going to be uh, one of the most important ones going forward in the future, um, and that is the importance of unplugging. Uh, and, and making a conscious effort to detach from all of our tech. 
Uh, I, I know you guys used to tease the shit out of me about the Adam Atler book that I shared years ago. Uh, but that was life changing for me, like reading that. And uh, I feel like, you know, pulling the curtains back on how they've designed this tech uh, to be so addictive and to attract people. And rightfully so. It's a business and that's what they're trying to do. So I don't I'm not demonizing the tools, but I think a lot of consumers are just completely unaware. Yeah, they're oblivious. Yeah, unaware. Mm -hmm. And I think if you were, you'd probably be a little more reluctant to hand your kid an iPad at two years old and mm -hmm. do things like that, that you don't know that may be setting you up for greater challenges as they get older. And so uh, because of this, I think this is one of the most important things. And that is just you know, scheduling that and putting yourself and what I do for myself uh, to protect myself from going down the rabbit hole of emails and social media and just tech in general is I have a hard time at, at, at night that just at that time, I don't care how busy I am at work or what's going on, that the phone goes up mm -hmm. uh, in my room, plugged into the charger for the night and I don't see it till the next day. And then I also have a time in the morning that I still wait before I get up and just look at social media or look at emails or look at text messages right away. So I have that window that I allow myself to consume and or use for work purposes. And once it's outside that window, I, I shut that down. And I think that this is going to become such an important practice for people in the future because it's so easy to uh, get sucked in. Well, it's one of the more challenging one I think piece people will face uh, because the, it's engineered in such a way where almost like everything is on the phone now. I mean, that you could justify. I could justify, I need this for directions. I need this for so-and-so is going to call me and, and I need to text all these people and I need to check my emails and like everything is there. And so it's a very challenging time that we're in now to be able to put that aside. And really it just revolves back to the first thing with the scheduling of food. It's the same a mentality going into that really have to start structuring your day in such a way where you're not reactionary towards all these things. You're, you're ahead of it. So yeah. I'm going to be ahead of it. I'm going to plan mm -hmm. this window during my day to accomplish as much as possible. And if I don't, it's okay. I'm just going to focus tomorrow. Yeah. Probably the biggest benefit of doing this is the shift in perspective mm -hmm. uh, that you get because what technology tends to do. And, and this is especially if you are on social media or reading news articles or, you know, Facebook, Instagram, you know, all the different, you know, media outlets online, what they tend to do is they tend to distort your perception of reality. So a simple example would be, you know, you're on, you're on uh, Instagram, you're following a bunch of fitness pages because you like to learn about fitness and health, but it's a lot of pictures of impossibly fit, perfect looking bodies. And without realizing, even if you're a self-aware per person, without realizing it, your brain starts to perceive that as the norm. Mm -hmm. So then you start to perceive yourself as far worse than you may actually be in terms of your levels of fitness, which can tend to make you feel worse. Another good example is reading news articles. I, if I go on any news outlet, I'm going to read clickbaity articles about what's going on in the world. So I'm going to read about some kid that got kidnapped over here and some, you know, this tra sex trafficking ring over there and this drug bust over there. But my brain perceives it as happening in front of me. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to develop a lot of fear and anxiety around this. Look, uh, we've known this for a long time. In fact, psychologists and therapists have told clients with lots of anxiety and stress to stop watching the news for, for decades. This is before technology got so good at putting this stuff in your face. And what happens when you unplug is you start to change your perception a little bit because now your perception is being shaped on real world interactions. You know, you, you go outside, you talk to your neighbors, you talk to your friends and family members. And what you start to realize is, oh, people are not nearly as crazy as it seems on social media. People are not as perfect looking as maybe I perceived on social media. Um, you get that real connection. You know, we evolved um, co you know, communicating with people in real life. Mm. It's a totally different um, yeah. feeling. There, there's a reward there. I think people forgot like the, the person to person interactions 
you get something out of that. You like you don't get uh, virtually. And, and it, it seems that, it, you, you know, it's it, this platform is so convenient that now I have access to grandma like across the country. I have all these different family members now that I could, you know, pay attention to. But a phone call would go a lot further or, you know, actual FaceTime, obviously, person to person, uh, you get a lot of tremendous value out of that. Yes, absolutely. Um, Now, the next one, uh, you know, this reminds me of uh, another client that I trained who I learned a a lot from. We had this whole this whole conversation about uh, competitiveness, and I am naturally a very competitive person. I like to compete. I like to win. Um, at whatever I'm competing at. And at the time when I was training this, uh, this client, I was quite young. I was in my early 20s, so it was like the peak of my obsession with, with winning. And we were having this conversation about, about winning. And I said uh, to him, I said, I love winning. It's like my favorite thing to do. I love to win. And he said, you know, that's not bad. He said, but uh, I, I, could, I could teach you a way that'll, make, that'll ensure that you're going to be more successful in life. And I said, okay, uh, what is that? He says, fall in love with growth instead of winning. And I'm like, what do you mean by that? He goes, well, in any competition, in your view, you either win or you lose. In my view, you either win or learn. He said, if you fall in love with growth, then you're going to become a better person, whether you win or lose. It doesn't matter what happens. Now, you can still be competitive. You could still try to win. But if you fall in love with growth, the reality is you're always winning because you're always becoming a, a better person. This is something I noticed with the most successful, super healthy clients that I trained, that they were very much enamored with just personal growth. It was mm-hmm. all about growth. And they were able to set aside their ego to examine some of their own behaviors, to examine some of their nutritional behaviors or exercise behaviors. You know, The, the growth-minded individuals that I trained when I would talk to them about over applying intensity, when I'd sit in front of them and say, you know, Mrs. Johnson, your your intensity is way too hard for your body right now. And I think that's what's preventing you from losing weight. Now, if she's not growth minded, she'd be like, well, what are you talking about? I'm burning more calories. I'm working out more hard. But because they were growth minded, they said, okay, well, you're a trainer. You obviously know what you're talking about. Let me be open minded to what you're saying. Let me give it a shot and see what happens. And because they were growth minded, they were extremely successful as a result of, uh, of it. So, the super healthy people I've ever worked with, all of them were growth minded. By the way, they also happen to be successful in other areas of the oh, life. Oh, I, I love this one. This one is for sure one of my favorite ones uh, because it, it took me till about 26 before the, the light bulb went off here. Like you, Sal, I think I was focused so much on winning and losing was a failure. And I looked at failures or losses like that sucks, don't want that to happen, but it wasn't as an opportunity for growth or learning. I think that didn't switch on until later, and it didn't switch on until I started working on self-improvement. So at 26, I began reading, really. I wasn't really reading much before that. And what I quickly started to pick up, besides what you just alluded to, which is you know, failures are opportunities for growth. I also noticed the momentum that you get when you're focused on personal growth. When you're seeking growth and you're wanting to get better in any aspect, it could be learning a, an instrument, it could be reading on self-improvement, it could mm-hmm. be doing working on your fitness. Whenever you're doing to improve yourself, I always felt it bleed into all the other aspects of my life. Mm-hmm. And when I'm not, I can always feel like this weight of the world on my shoulders. When I'm not focused on growth or doing something to improve who I am, making a, a better version of myself for e- every day, I can always tell how that affects every other aspect of my life. And when I'm working on that, I can feel how it bleeds into everything else. And so from 26 on to today, that is probably one of the number one things that I would say really contributed to a lot of the success was that momentum that I gained from always focusing on personal growth. It was cool for me to see that uh, play out with with some of my clients in particular as well who um, really prioritized themselves uh, for like the first time. And you could see that where um, now is the opportunity for them to improve uh, physically, which then, uh, you know, also improved other habits, their sleep improved, their school performance improved, their relationships, uh, you know, with their parents or their significant other. They started to have, you know, better conversations. Uh, and it was just a snowball effect of things that uh, transpired as a result of them really kind of taking that time to, uh, you know, hone in on working on 
themselves and, and being growth minded and and going through that process. And I think that's that that's one of these these areas. If everybody could just really take the time to uh, experience it, it takes it takes some courage, it takes some bravery to do something new. And I think that's obviously that's the big barrier for a lot of people to 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 be challenged with. But if you do pursue it, it really does affect everything in a positive way. Oh yeah, if you're growth minded, if you're seeking growth, all these points that we're listing in this episode are going to work for you. If you're not, it's going to be very difficult to adopt any of these if they're not ones that you already uh, do. Um, now, the next one took me a long time to figure out for myself, but I did figure it out for my clients. You know, we, we really do take sleep for granted. And what I mean by that is I think a lot of people realize the importance of sleep, but we take it for granted because we do whatever we're doing throughout the day, and then we just turn the lights off, hit the pillow, and expect to have uh, amazing sleep. It really doesn't work that way. Now, it's not because sleep is something you have to work hard towards necessarily. Mainly, it's because modern life doesn't lend itself well to good sleep. You know, for, uh, for again, for most of human history, we, our brains slowly got into sleep mode as the sun set. We didn't have electronic lights. We didn't have electronics that we were looking into. We were outside doing our thing. As the sun began to set, our brain got that signal, perceived it, and said, okay, slowly winding down, getting ready for sleep. I'm pretty sure we didn't cook food in the middle of the night. That's like a nice dinner bell for uh, you know predators all around us. So we didn't eat close to bedtime. And our brains and bodies prepared for sleep before we got to sleep. We're not like a, a you know, it's not like your cell phone where you could just shut power off and it's off. The body actually needs to prepare itself for sleep. The most successful, healthy people I've ever met actually put some priority in sleep. They actually treat, they actually take it seriously. They don't just expect to get good sleep. They have sleep routines. Now, that may look like in the past with a lot of my clients, this looked like dim lights and reading. I had many, many successful clients who this was a strategy. This was just something that they did an hour or two before bed. They have like a, a a dim night light that they put on or a book light that they clip on the on the top of the book and then they read about an hour or two before bed and go to sleep. Now for them, I don't know if they realized that they were really prioritizing sleep. I think they just thought it was a great way to wind down and read uh, you know, a nice book. But really what they were doing is they were setting their body up for sleep. Now we have science that shows the value of this. When you prepare yourself for sleep by not exposing yourself to bright lights, by not eating a big meal right before bed, uh, by having your bedroom set up for a good sleep experience, you, you know, cool with the blinds shut, no light coming in. It's clear. The evidence is clear. You see the, the stages of sleep are more effective. People fall asleep faster. They wake up more refreshed. Hormones, as a result, reflect their, their good sleep. Fat loss is easier. Cravings tend to go down. This is a very important one. It's not a hard one to do, by the way. You don't, there's not this crazy, you know, it's like you have to follow this crazy workout or understand nutrition in and out. Really, it's just about taking it seriously, just preparing your body for sleep. I think a reason why it's not, uh, a lot of people don't have success with it because I think a lot of people are unaware they're not having success with it, right? I think a lot of people, uh, there's nobody who doesn't sleep, right? <laughs> so everybody sleeps. So I think everybody assumes that, oh, I'm fine. I get I get up and I've been sleeping my whole life every single night. I get up about my day. And I think they're just unaware of what it looks like when you really optimize sleep. At least for that's what it was for me. Like I just assumed that because I got up every day and crushed every day that it was I wasn't lacking in the sleep department. And until I start just like the tracking of the water or paying attention to your macros and calculating and weighing your food, like it's just one of those things until you really start to pay attention to it, you don't realize how much better it can be if you put a little effort towards it. Mm. And to your point, Sal, it can be just that simple. It could be as simple as just agreeing, make just like we talked about the unplugging and having a time zone. You just agree that, hey, Katrina and I just did this again. Like we changed it because Max is on a new sleep schedule, right? So he sleeps about 12 hours now. He goes down at 730. And, but he is up like come six thirty seven. he is up and ready to be up. There's no like laying down and wanting to nap anymore or relaxing kind of what it was before because when he was getting up multiple times in the night, it was like these little three hour windows we were sleeping with with him because we were constantly having to get up with him. Well, now that he sleeps consistently, when he's ready to get up, he's ready to get up, mm -hmm. which means we now have to adjust our time of going to bed. Before, Katrina and I would allow ourselves to stay up till 10 30, 11 30 at night on a regular basis. 
And now that's not working because now it's interrupting our sleep when he's ready to go for the day. And so, you know, we've set this just, oh, hey, by 930, we have to be in bed. Mm-hmm. And if we're going to, if we're still awake or whatever that, then we listen to an audio book or we just dim the lights and we talk and have communication for 30 minutes. Like that's kind of this new rule that we have. And it's just that simple. You don't have to do anything crazy or add anything or put that much thought into it. But that little bit of organizing, hey, we're going to go to bed at this time. We're going to turn the lights down. And at that point, we're just going to either be conversing or reading a book uh, does wonders for setting your sleep up. Yeah, I think if you ask somebody, just a random person, like, have you ever felt like super refreshed in, in uh, like you had like the best night's sleep ever, the, you know, and, and they could kind of recount a, a time where that happened. But, you know, well, what did you do that led up to that? Like, I doubt they could even, you know, tell you what all the what all that looked like. And I think if, if people just put more effort in understanding, uh, you know, how they set themselves up to to have that feeling, to have that feeling of being refreshed and having, you know, this vibrant energy in the morning, uh, you know, obviously you're going to see the benefit to that. And there is a way to do that. Right. Now, the next one, near and dear to all of our hearts, we talk about this all the time, and that is to build muscle and lift weights. Um, there is no form of exercise that is better suited to combat the, the the troubles and challenges, the health challenges of modern life, like resistance training, like lifting weights. It's the only form of exercise that will positively influence your metabolism. And when I say positively, I mean speed it up. So it actually teaches the body to burn more calories. It's also protective against a sedentary lifestyle, which is the common lifestyle that we now have. Even if you work out, most of your day is probably sedentary. Most jobs now require very, very little uh, activity. Not necessarily a bad thing, but you want to protect against the negatives of that, building muscle does that. It's also the only form of exercise that has been shown in men to reliably raise testosterone levels. And in women, if applied properly, it's one of the most effective ways of exercising to balance out estrogen and progesterone. Muscle also is a wonderful protection against insulin insensitivity issues or insulin resistance, which is a big problem nowadays. By the way, uh, you know, brain disorders, Alzheimer's and dementia, uh, many scientists will say is a form of insulin resistance. In fact, Alzheimer's, some scientists will call type 3 diabetes. Lifting weights is the best form of exercise when you consider the context of modern life. Here's the best part about it. You don't, you don't have to do it every single day. Right. Most people can lift weights two days a week, uh, maybe three days a week, and you're going to reap most of the benefits I just talked about. Uh, I'm going to even challenge that a little bit, and that's because you know, there's a there's a very good chance like our single topic episodes get shared the most, right? So there's probably thousands of people listening to us for the first time with this. And if you're somebody who is not already into fitness and lifting weights on a consistent basis, even one day a week of a full body routine, if you are doing all these other things, can make a huge difference in yeah, your life. That's true. And it's very different than how I would have approached fitness, you know, ten years ago. Uh, back in the days, I would never tell a client they could lift weights only one day a week. It was just like, oh my God, you need to be in here at least three to seven days a week. And that's so not true. In fact, you're far better off if you're not doing anything right now, just starting one day a week, becoming very consistent with that before you go to two and then eventually go to three. And even just doing one full body workout a week with all the other things that we're talking about, you would be surprised what a healthy person that you would be just from that alone. Yeah. I would say if you're new to working out and you need some some structure and some guidance, we have a workout program called Map Starter, um, which is a great place to start. But we have a lot of uh, workout programs you can choose from that'll fit um, you know, your body and your goals. But really lifting weights is, and, and, and now we have, finally we have studies that are showing this by itself, uh, in comp- if you compare it to other solitary forms of exercise, it's the most effective form when yeah. you consider the, you know, modern life again, when you consider the problems that we're encountering Everything from obesity to diabetes to osteoporosis uh, in women. Um, Lifting weights. And again, it doesn't take much. This is a wonderful thing about it. Mm -hmm. Lifting weights is just sending a signal to your body that says we need more muscle. It's not like you're doing it to burn tons of calories. Unlike other forms of exercise, you don't need to do it all the time to reap uh, the amazing benefits. Yeah, and that's the thing is uh, it doesn't have to be all that often. I mean, strength 
training itself like uh, provides you with abilities. So, you know, strength itself is something that you want to be able to keep and maintain because, you know, as we age, we're going to start losing these abilities. And the, this is something that we need to express constantly uh, with our joints to, to also prevent uh, arthritis and other pains and other discomforts and, and really improves your overall quality of life. So it's something definitely to consider in your routine. Totally. Now the next one, this one's interesting to me because you know, with as as modern medicine or Western medicine progresses, one of the 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 drawbacks sometimes is we forget old wisdom. Now we tend to rediscover it later on, which is what's happening right now with this next one. But we did forget it for a little while. You know, at the at the at the in the early days of Western medicine, if a child was sick, if your elderly parent was sick, or if you weren't feeling good, if you were feeling down, you were feeling sad, you were feeling a little bit of pain. Something that people used to say was go outside and get some fresh air. This was something that they did all the time. In fact, they would do this with babies uh, where they would they would have babies go and sit next to a window mm -hmm. or they'd put them outside to get some fresh air. And it's because they noticed, this is old wisdom, by the way. You see this in all old uh, you know medicine practices, Chinese medicine, Ayurvedic medicine as well, that going outside has these positive health effects. Now, science is now supporting this, right? We see that when people go outside – Feel good chemicals tend to go up. Getting sunlight boosts uh, vitamin D levels and has positive effects on inflammation. And when you consider how little we go outside nowadays in modern societies, it's even more important. If you think about all the time you spend outside mm -hmm. versus the time you spend inside, it's probably a ratio of 95% to 5%. Probably 95% of the time you spend awake is not outside. We did not evolve that way. We need to be outside. Now, this is we're solar power. We, you need. You don't need to go outside all day long, but dedicating some time outside or doing maybe some of your work outside, sitting on your laptop outside, mm -hmm. it does have huge health benefits. This is a big one for me. I make sure every single day I go outside for at least an hour, and if I don't, I can tell a, a marked difference in how I feel. Well, this one feeds big time into the sleep one too, right? For uh, setting your circadian rhythm, right? So I notice a big difference when I go straight from home to work, and then we sit underneath these fluorescent lights, and we work all day long until the sun goes down and go home, and how hard it is for me to fall asleep versus when I make a conscious effort first thing in the morning to get out, whether I'm walking the dogs or just going for a stroll and absorbing that sunlight early on in the day to set the tone for my timing, my clock, you know, so my, so my body knows that, hey, it's daytime, it's the beginning of the day when it's supposed to start to wind down later on. When we're constantly getting this artificial light all the time, it confuses your body into what time it is and is it time to go to bed simply by going out and getting into the sun early on in the day does wonders for you also setting your sleep up later on in the evening. Oh, if you're doing the walks, like we talked about earlier, the walk breaks, mm -hmm. there you go. You're, you're walking. a combo right there. Yeah, you're walking outside, so you're doing your walk, and you're getting, you know, you're being outside and getting that sunlight. Right. Now, the next one, this one's also very important. This one is connected to the lifting weights, one that we talked about, and that is to stay mobile or maintain your mobility. Um, if To keep it as simple as possible, really it's about practicing things you don't want your body to forget. Okay, so if you don't want your body to forget how to run, you should probably practice a little bit of running. If you don't want to, your body to forget how to bend over to pick something up, reach up above your head, mm -hmm. squat down. Turn and, and reach behind you. Turn, reach behind you, jump off of a curb or jump up on top of a curb. You probably want to practice these things to maintain your mobility. Now, if you want to take it a step further and make it really effective – you do some dedicated mobility work with dedicated mobility exercises. That probably will give you the best results. I'll be even more prescriptive, right? So we created a webinar at uh, primeprowebinar.com, and it's free, and it's an hour long, and I take you through every major joint, and we do mobility drills in there. If you don't, if you're listening to this and you're like, okay, I, I want to start doing this or include this routine, go through that. And then begin to implement some of those moves throughout your week. And you don't need to do it all in one one hour setting. I take you through it in an hour setting. And if you've got that uh, dedication and you enjoy doing it for an hour, that's totally fine. But another way you can do this is take all those movements and break them up through the week and set them up as little five, 10 minute increments just to add mobility every single day. And that in itself will do wonders for your mobility. Oh, yeah. And primeprowebinar.com is free. And mm -hmm. it's really go on there and take it, 
See how you feel before. See how you how you feel afterwards. Right, you'll feel it right away. Oh, right away. Right. It's not like you got to do this for you know a few weeks before you notice a difference. You'll notice a difference right away when you practice. It. Yeah, and it's great because a lot of those moves will kind of show you, uh, you know, where when your body isn't in alignment, the the difference that you feel immediately from that, and you'll notice it in in the way you carry yourself, uh, your posture, uh, you know, your energy levels. It just carries with you throughout the day, and so. Uh, to be able to apply moments of uh, you know these rituals throughout your day in just chunks, uh, watch what that will do uh, for you uh, with with all this other stuff throughout your day. Yeah. Now this next one's really interesting. Um, you know, it's funny when you look at studies on longevity. One thing always pops out that I think scientists have a tough time, uh, you know, talking about. It's consistent though. Like every longevity study shows that people who have a mindfulness practice, now it usually is in the form of prayer. Um, I think that's the most popular way or most common way people uh, practice mindfulness, but it could also be a meditation or a gratitude uh, practice. But every single longevity study I've ever seen that's done on lots of people shows that people who have a daily practice of prayer or mindfulness their their chances of dying from all causes is significantly lower by itself. This is when they control all factors, diet, activity, they control sleep, they control for smoking and alcohol. By itself, practicing mindfulness every single day reduces people's risks of all-cause uh, mortality. You know, I was watching uh, that show on Netflix alone where people are mm. sent off into the into the Arctic. This is I think is I think it's season 6 or whatever. And it's so interesting watching these people live in the middle of nowhere for you know two, three, four months or whatever at a time, and to see how grateful they are when they catch a squirrel or a fish, things that we tend to yeah. take for granted, how happy they are. And it's interesting watching that and seeing how happy they feel in that moment and how sad I feel watching Netflix eating a burger or whatever <laughs> on my couch. And it's like, this is totally a mindset, and like anything, you got to practice it to get good at it. Well, this also, to, to Justin's point that he's made a few times now, I think, uh, comes to mind for me, which is it takes us out of that reactive state, right? All, uh, many times we, we start our day, and we're right, right into it. You wake up, you roll over, you open up your email, your social, you're either reacting to the, the likes or the dislikes or the bad comments or the email that you got to get to work and do stuff or... Life, life hits us in the face and then we spend the whole day just reacting to all these things and never once do we get to stop and kind of gather our thoughts, be grateful for where we are currently in our life and then also start to wrap your brain around planning other stuff, planning all these things that we're talking about. I feel like this one's perfect as the, as the last habit because I feel like getting this in place helps you set the other nine up. Like if you are listening to this list and you're like, man, that's a lot of things. I'm not really doing any of them or there's half of them on here. I'm not really doing start here, mm -hmm. start here with this one and practice this, whether it be meditation, whether it be prayer, whether it be just being still for a good half hour or an hour out of your day, you start there and that will set the tone for all these other things. Cause it'll, it'll, what it'll do is it'll allow you to clear that mental space. You're not plugged in, you're not doing anything else, you're being still and in the moment, and then I can start to gather my thoughts on all these other habits that I want to build. Well, it just also reminds me of ancient wisdom uh, and why we have rituals and we have these things, uh, you know, part of our day in certain cultures, uh, and it's 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 for certain reasons. And, and one, especially like two, like we, we pray or we meditate, you know, before we eat like a dinner together. And like, why do we do that? And mm -hmm. it's, it's, I remember going through that and watching Paul check and he had that realization of, you know, this really puts me in that parasympathetic state. Like now I'm calming my body down and, you know, and I'm more receptive towards, you know, this food and, and, and utilizing its nutrients. And, you know, and this is something that I didn't even really realize uh, till later, if I'm in a rush and I'm eating, like how that affects like my gut health and how now I'm going to be fighting this, this heartburn and all these things like uh, as a result of not really calming myself down and being in a better state. Uh, going into that. And it's the same with uh, getting ready for bed, you know, and you see a lot of these uh, religions and cultures that, you know, have prayer before bed or have gratitudes or have meditation practices. Uh, and it's all there for a very specific reason. Yeah, it's, it's ancient wisdom. It's wisdom that you see across the world in every culture 
They all practice this, and you know we we tend to be okay with uh, you know saying that evolution is a real thing from a biological standpoint. Oh, we see bacteria evolve. We think animals evolve. People forget that ideas evolve as well, and the ones that stick around for thousands of years, there's something to them. And every single culture that we've ever observed has some form of a mindfulness practice, either in the form of meditation or gratitude or usually in the form of prayer. So there's a tremendous amount of value. And by the way, there's lots of these things that we're talking about that can be combined. For example, we talked about prioritizing your sleep. Why not do your gratitude or prayer or mindfulness right before bed? Before yeah. you go to bed, or do that when you're walking. Oh, by the way, if you do it while you're walking, you're also outside. So now you've hit three all in one. So all these things are not things that you have to do by themselves. Mm -hmm. They're really just habits. They're habits that you do throughout the day and do better as you pair them. And that's right. right, and they tend to work better when you pair them. But again, we wrote this list because these are the things that we observed and are most successful super healthy clients, the ones that keep it long-term forever and seem to have the most effortless time doing it all. Look, Mind Pump is recorded on video as well as audio. Come find us on YouTube so you can watch our faces while we talk. You can also find all of us on Instagram. You can find Doug, the producer at Mind Pump Doug. You can find Justin at Mind Pump Justin. You can find me at Mind Pump Sal and Adam at Mind Pump Adam. I got to come clean uh, with you guys uh -oh. about about something. Finally, Adam and I have been waiting for this. Yeah, yeah. I feel like, yeah. yeah. We've been talking about this. For you a guys time. were going to have an intervention. Hey, something was going to happen at some point. To so. make it easy on you, it's been very obvious for Sal and I for a long Has time. Has it? Yeah. We yeah. like you no matter what. Really? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> this is a no judgment zone. I mean, I come in here every now and then. I'm complaining about my hips. You know, I got 